Hey everyone, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. It's Sarah, and nice to see you all again for another Backstage Pass. And today we are waiting for Paulina Nezinska. Oh, and here she is. And Paulina, we're going to bring you in. And we're waiting. Waiting for Paulina. And hi. hi. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm so doing okay. To you. Good to see you too. Where are you? Are you in New Haven? New Haven, Connecticut. Nice. Nice. How are you surviving this very strange time? Oh, this you're, is my... just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you're still working, this, which is this great. Is my everything, you know, this helped me a lot during the yeah. quarantine. Oh, I was I just bet. so grateful to be able to compose, you know. Yeah. I was lucky to have a few commissions. So the quarantine was great for me because I was just working nonstop. No kidding. No what, what commissions are you working on right now? Uh, it's a large scale opera for Mississippi ah, Opera. Uh, okay. It's a huge project, two hours of music. So I had to present the first act uh, to the artistic director on July 1st. So that wow. was my kind of main goal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a few smaller ones, uh, such as Caprices for Violin Solo. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a great excuse for me to start practicing again, because I'm a violinist. <laughs> that's that right, that's right. So I wow. wrote five Caprices. I call them quarantine Caprices. <laughs> 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 hey, at least you have a sense of humor. That's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. It was great because, you know, I realized that everyone is locked at home and uh, they're bored. You know, my, my friends, violinists, and they, they keep asking me, when are you writing for us? And I said, this right, is a good right, time. Right. <laughs> yeah. So you're keeping busy. That's great. That's great. Well, some of us are not so busy, you know, so. I know. Yeah, yeah, it's a challenge. So, hey, I want to sort of, for our viewers, sort of go back to the very beginning and sort of talk about how you came to be a composer. But you started out as, uh, you play the piano and the violin and what else, the flute? Am I remembering this correctly? Flute, yeah, Ooh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Roots. <laughs> yeah. So tell me yeah, a little bit like about, instruments. you know, how you began in music and, you know, was your family musical? How did you come to it? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a legend in my family that when I was two years old, I uh, came to the piano and I played a final scene from Glinka's opera with my two mm -hmm. hands, you know, without, without any lessons, I just picked up my ear, both of my uh, siblings were playing mm -hmm. as a piano, uh, four hands piano, you know, they were playing mm -hmm. this piece. And I just came to the piano and I played it. Uh, and then my mom realized that um, she has this child <laughs> with some kind of gift. Uh, and this is how it all started, you know, and then um, because I'm, I'm from a small town, Taliati, Russia, mm -hmm. um, people didn't know what to do with me, really. They said, well, you have to master an instrument. So mm -hmm. um, they checked my, uh, you know, how, how was my ears and, and mm -hmm. I have perfect pitch. So they said, why then would be good for you? <laughs> and I started, <laughs> I started, um, I started learning how to play violin, but then I quickly realized it wasn't enough for me. So of course I went on the piano and mm -hmm. also flute because my best friend played flute, played flute, and I said to myself, I need to learn this instrument as well. So growing up, I couldn't decide. So for the first 15 years, I was playing three instruments very seriously. Wow. But then I, I, I actually decided to go into and become a violinist more seriously because I loved the music that was written for the violin. Uh, and I had great teachers. So uh, after graduating from my music school, special music school, mm -hmm. Uh, in my hometown, I went to Moscow Conservatory as a violinist, and then I, I realized it wasn't enough for me again, <laughs> you know. I felt like my emotions were just boiling over and uh, playing someone else's music, uh, no matter how great it was, it wasn't mm -hmm. enough for me. So mm -hmm. um, I kind of started sketching some of my own ideas, and I kind of remember that I was composing uh, from the very beginning, but it's just uh, because I'm from a small town, no one knew what to do with me. So they said, you have to learn the instrument first, and then you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and I followed that advice. You know, I became a violinist. Uh, my final recital was uh, Prokofiev Second Violin Concerto and Bach D minor uh, pre, uh, uh, suite, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Partita. Uh, so yeah. pretty serious um, rep, and then I. I was going to say that's that's a big that's a big rep to be playing. Yeah. yeah, and I decided to finish that recital with my own piece, oh. and it's, uh, that was it. You know, that was the stamp mm -hmm. that I, I was done with the violin, and I was uh, about to go on and become a composer professionally. Mm -hmm. So um, I submitted uh, 
several pieces to the Yale School of Music, you know, mm-hmm. seeing uh, this mm-hmm. 19 years old uh, violinist <laughs> from a small town. I just said, well, Yale looks good because, you know, I, I, re- I realized it was, uh, they provided full scholarship. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, this looks good. <laughs> yeah. I'll apply. <laughs> because obviously uh, I didn't have any money mm-hmm. to pay for my education. Mm-hmm. So I submitted my portfolio to Yale and miraculously I got invited to the final round and I came to the States and uh, I was invited to come to Yale. So that's my story in short. That's a, but, that's um, a great story. So you did you start writing before you went to Moscow Conservatory or was that where you started writing? I remember that I was writing my whole life, to be honest, but mm-hmm. it was more improvisational kind of thing. You know, I would mm-hmm, sit down mm-hmm. at the piano and I would play something that was going on in my mind. And right, I right. Wouldn't even, I wouldn't even consider writing it down. I didn't know how to do that. But I remember mm-hmm. that I was improvising a lot. Uh, but in Moscow, uh, when I was at the Moscow Conservatory, I met my first uh, teacher, composition teacher, um, mm. who changed my life pretty much. He, he was so amazing, you know, and he taught me how to become a, a more serious composer, how to yeah. write my own music, how mm-hmm. to structure my thoughts in more, you know, logical right. way. Uh, I'm still in touch with him. He just got Skype, you know, I Skyped with him this morning. He's 83 years old. <laughs> I was and he figured out Skype. Good for him. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It was That's... my dream, you know. Yeah. I had to do. I, I. I actually. I got him that computer, you know, as a surprise <laughs> birthday, birthday present. Through another student of his, I. Um, now he's, is a Skype user. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm about that. He called me five in the morning. He's like. Oh what? great! Right. How it's are like, you? <laughs> do you understand what time it is? <laughs> yeah. It was so wonderful. You know, my, my heart was pounding, you know, I, I thought I, I will die because he's probably the most important teacher in my life, you know, and mm-hmm. he really changed my life for better. I wasn't sure what was happening, but, you know, I was just so blessed that, you know, I was able to study violin and composition at the same right, time. Right, right. Um, yeah. Although I was studying composition not officially in the Moscow Conservatory, you know, I was a violinist. No, nobody right. knew that mm-hmm. I was compo- composing mm-hmm. seriously. Uh, and then, you know, I went to Yale and uh, it was just wonderful. Uh, all of a sudden I found myself with all those incredible opportunities you know, mm-hmm. to write for orchestra, to write for singers. Right. Um, yeah. The composition program at Yale is, is a dream come true yeah. really for, yeah. for a young composer. That's great. And, uh, so w- when you were younger, what composers inspired you? Who did you listen to? Who did you not want to write like, because you mm-hmm. want to write like yourself, but who influenced you? It's a very good question because, you know, my mom, uh, being a very smart woman, she would go to Moscow and she would bring back some recordings. She didn't know, really. She's an architect, so she's not a musician, but Mm -hmm. she would bring Bruckner symphonies. She would bring uh, Bartok concerto for orchestra, you know, very obscure (laughs) for for a teenage girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, I grew up listening to a concerto for orchestra by Bartok. I remember laying down, you know, and listening to the, Mm -hmm. the strange music and just loving it so much. But um, I think what influenced me the most is actually Russian folk music, you know, because mm-hmm. I always loved uh, singing, Russian mm-hmm. folk singing. I, I would hear it on the streets, you know, because I'm from a small town and people still sing on the streets there. So right, right. It, it's kind of, it's crazy, but it's yeah, wonderful. So I, I think my style is really a mix of so many things, but in the core of it is uh, Russian-ness, you know. The Russian, <laughs> Russian, yeah. Yeah, Russian-ness, uh, big sweeping melodies uh you know <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> of course a lot of soul you know i think yeah. russian music has has true soul which is what i love about it um so i'm gonna jump around but for those of us or those of us those of you who are watching who are not musicians you probably wonder what exactly does the composer do what's the process by which you you know create your work how do you ask to, you know, how are you commissioned? What, what are those processes like? So in essence, you know, if we are not talking about, you know, making a living as a composer, mm-hmm. but in, essentially uh, being a composer is someone who is translating uh, their thoughts and ideas into music, you know, their poets, their writers. Uh, and it's pretty much the same, but through music, you are expressing certain ideas. So, and then mm-hmm. um, there's this magical dust <laughs> that I don't know how to explain it. You turn your ideas into notes, you know? <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, like that. So I still write uh, by hand. And hopefully, you know, one time goes by and you produce enough work and you can kind of prove that you are a serious um, artist. People start commissioning you, but um, 
this uh, there is no recipe you know how to mm -hmm. become a successful composer you, what's important is just if you have something to say musically you mm -hmm. just you just gotta figure out how to do it right to be able to say it mm -hmm. so when you are saying something I mean you sort of touched on this but how would you describe your style I mean there's so many ways of expression especially in the 21st and 20th century there were just so many veins in different directions that classical music went to so as an artist as a as a composer which what direction do you take how do you find your voice it's a, such a good question you know and I, everyone will answer this differently i can speak for myself you know i i because i kind of went from a, being a violinist uh, a big romantic music really influenced me as a composer mm. so i love long phrases i love beautiful um harmonies that uh, are uh, rather harmonious you know mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. i consider myself a new romantic composer okay um but in the 21st century um there's room for everyone you know if you hear the wor world around you in an abstract way and you want uh more atonal music please mm -hmm, there, mm -hmm. it's uh, there's no boundaries really um if you want to write rap mixed with classical and orchestra uh, orchestral right. music why not I feel like this is a great time right now. A lot of freedom, you know. It wasn't mm. like that always, you know. There, there were schools of thought. And, exactly, uh, exactly. Um, I'm very grateful that I'm not uh, living in the 70s, you know. <laughs> I'm here true, now. That's true. Yeah, yeah. It was more subscribed what you could do. Where, where mm. do you sort of see stylistically things going in the future? I mean, you're doing some teaching as well, so you probably see even the next generation coming up. But mm -hmm. you know, do you have any ideas of what what might be the next thing? For everyone, it will be a little different, but I love what my students are doing. They're pretty, pretty much mixing uh, popular culture into classical music, which mm -hmm. I love because it speaks to a wider uh, audience. Mm -hmm. um, I love that direction, you know, like bringing um, electric guitar in the orchestra, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, doing some spoken word, you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe reciting some um, uh, magazines, you know, with the orchestra. Mm -hmm. So anything that's relevant, that's... Um, for an artist, you know, for an artist, mm -hmm. what's important at this very moment. Um, right. So I'd encourage the young composers not to be so much self-conscious about the style. Uh, it's important to produce the best work in any style. It doesn't matter, really. Um, mm -hmm. Again, there, there's a lot of contro controversy about this. You know, people can say, oh, this is not modern enough, you know, but I, right, right, right. Mm -hmm. I really feel like we have to look beyond style, you know, and if there is a, a thought, uh, mm -hmm. an idea, uh, it can be expressed in so many different styles. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Really. No, that makes so much sense. So let's say that you're going to sit down and write a piece. This is a very artificial yeah. situation, right? Yeah. So, okay, Pauline, sit down and yeah. write a piece. What What are the like the first steps? If someone commissions you to write, let's say a symphonic poem, do you have ahead of time an idea of what the thematic material, even the overarching mm -hmm. idea mm -hmm. might be? Or... How does that work? It, it, sure, it depends on the situation. Of, of sometimes the, uh, uh, a person or an orchestra uh, who commissions the piece, they suggest a, a theme. Mm -hmm. uh, but we live in such, a, in such times that we have those crazy things happening in the world. And I don't think that we can now, right now, we can write about something like that's so detached, detached from mm -hmm. what's going on right, right now. Right, right. So, uh, inevitably, it will influence us as artists what, on mm -hmm. what's going on in the world uh, will be reflecting and we are human beings you know we have feelings and uh, we are not isolated so um, one 99% that it will be related to the current situation either mm -hmm. political or whatever um, but uh, yes so then so for instance you are preoccupied with an idea uh, mm -hmm. Uh, in a, an ideal situation, it um, coincides with the idea of the orchestral commission, you know? Right, So right. it's not if, if you're w wanting to write about, uh, you know, certain political situation and mm -hmm. the orchestra is telling you, can you write uh, about a, an abstract love story? You know, that's right. not ideal. But <laughs> two very different then, things, right, right. Even then, you can kind of blend the two together mm -hmm, somehow. Mm -hmm. So it's always, um, I don't believe that it's possible to be so detached from your emotions but it's me you know mm -hmm. some composers are more um logical you know and they can detach from their feelings and just right. uh, go with a uh, structure with an idea abstract idea i i am not like that you know like i always kind of translate what i'm feeling right now what i'm preoccupied with mm -hmm. um so 
for instance, we have this idea, right? So do you want to pick a, a theme? Let's, let's pick a theme. <laughs> let's pick a theme. Oh, let's say um, uh, cabin fever. <laughs> Being <laughs> locked at home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How's that? All right. It's a, so, um, it's a very topical theme, yes. It is very good. So how are we feeling? Are we feeling uh, restless, right? We want to go out. We want to do things, but we can't mm -hmm. because it's dangerous. We don't want mm -hmm. to put people in danger and ourselves mm -hmm. in danger. So there's this conflict already, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> even for those people who love and be, love being, at, you know, locked at home, and I'm one of those people, I, I, I'm always at home, <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> but there's this uh, notion that you cannot go, right? So mm -hmm. there's this conflict. So right. if you want, but you can't. So we can play on that conflict, the inner conflict, you know, and we can kind of translate that feeling into the music in so many different ways. You know, we can have uh, contrasting um, musical uh, instruments, like groups mm -hmm. of instruments, you know, strings versus uh, winds or brass, mm -hmm. right? So just juxtaposition of what we mm -hmm. want or like mm -hmm. what we can do, right? So right, for example, right. we can do tonal versus atonal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but this is very simple, like, you know, making stuff up right now it's it's more um detail it's more it's more difficult than that yeah but yeah uh, those are just ideas you know how but we I, I like the thought process of finding you know not just a theme but finding within the theme the the emotions and conflicts and then representing mm -hmm. those musically um mm -hmm. so it, i mean it is a very complicated and, and detailed process that you just mm -hmm. sort of gave us an overview <laughs> on. so yes. but what do you do you start sketching ideas i saw that you had a uh a notepad so do you you do write by hand Yes, yes. I yeah. always write by hand first. Uh, I have a grand piano here, baby grand that I love. It's out of tune right now. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. uh, I usually start by just kind of massaging the piano, you know, just playing whatever mm -hmm. comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And if something speaks to me, just immediately I try to write it down. Mm -hmm. um, it always comes from a very tiny motive or a harmony, you know, or a chord. So it's like the seed that you have, like the emotional seed that mm -hmm. contains all the information that will unfold later on. Right, right. And that's really, I don't know how to explain this. It just, it's magical. <laughs> it's magical right, it just you know? comes to you, right? It's not yes. that, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But you have to be in a certain mood, a certain, um, I cannot watch Instagram and write, you know, I, I completely shut <laughs> all of the, you know, We would hope that you're not doing those two things at the same time. No, yeah. no, <laughs> only separately. But, you know, when I, I'm editing something and that's, uh, you know, very laborious and boring process, I can turn on yeah. things, mm -hmm. you know, and watch and while editing parts, mm -hmm. like for printing that I can mm -hmm. do. Although I prefer not to because, you know, I tend to make mistakes. Right. So it's always good to be 100% focused on what mm -hmm. you're doing. Mm -hmm. But when you're composing, it's, for me, it's a different state of mind, you know, yeah. it's not very, it's not very family friendly, you know, I, but I get very emotional and, you know, <laughs> well, that's so interesting. Do you, do you not want to see people? Do you want to be alone with your thoughts? Yeah. Yes. Oh. Yes. But and if someone calls me, it's not good. You know, I try to switch off, you know, everything, but I can't do it. You know, in the modern times, you have to be connected. You have to be plugged in, you know, because what if LA Philharmonic is, is calling you and you're not answering? <laughs> right, right. You don't want to miss that phone call. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's this fine balance, you know, just I'm trying to uh, keep the phone away, you know, and mm -hmm. look every three hours, something like that, if someone calls. Mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. interesting. I mean, yeah, we, we now have these digital distractions as well. It's not just someone walking into the room, but also a text or an email or a phone call. Right. I mean, does that like within, say you're spending the morning working and mm -hmm. you do have to address something. Do you have a train, a musical train of thought that gets disturbed when that happens? Mm -hmm. um, I try to finish the, the thought that's coming, you know, and I, I try to write it however, however badly, you know, I'm writing mm -hmm. very fast, but like the notes are very important for me. The rhythm I can fill in later, you know, but mm -hmm. the harmonies, the melodies, it's what I start with. Uh, so if, if I have this uh, nice musical phrase, I try to write it down and then only go and, mm -hmm. and address the issue, you know, because right. for me, this is so precious, you know, when a music comes and feels right, it's not easy, you know, to, mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. catch that, uh, that moment. It's yeah, very precious, yeah. you know, it, it takes hours to just get that one note right, you know, it's not right, that I'm just right, writing right, all right. the time. It's a little, it's a little crazy, to be honest, you know, I can like sitting, I can be sitting for six hours and nothing comes. So uh, I was going to ask you that because mm -hmm. I mean, I used to compose, but not for many, many years now, but now I write actually. And I have mm -hmm. writer's block sometimes where right. I just, I'm at the, you yeah. know, the keyboard yeah. and just, I don't know what words to put down. It, I, there must be an equivalent mm -hmm. for composers of writer's block. Do you, ex ex you know, experience yes. that at all? Quite, quite often. But yes. <laughs> quite often. <laughs> yes, but, uh, I, I have, yeah, <laughs> you know, I have 
some uh, life hacks, but that works that work for me. Uh, what helps me is to play Bach on any instrument that I, I can. You know, oh. I play Bach, uh, and his music just tunes my brain into a very right place. You know, and I start. You know, I decided mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. start my my day by playing. You know, a few preludes from from Walter Amper Clavier or you know Invention. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not a very good pianist, so obviously it's not like, and I, you know, I, I actually thought to myself, I don't even want anyone to see this. This is purely for me. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in the digital world, there's always this um, desire to be seen, you know, and right, desire right. to share, not for everyone, but, but I love sharing my music. So mm-hmm. it's always like, oh, let me show what I'm doing now. But this is such a sacred um, ritual for me. You know, so I start my day by playing Bach and it really helps. And I, I try to end my day by playing Bach. So it's like this, you know, sort of like it's a book, really, yeah. really... No, I love that. Sort of, you know, it opens up your mind and then sort of closes those ideas. And mm-hmm. so so what's a, a, a typical day for you if, you if you're in the midst of writing? Uh, Are you a morning person, an evening uh, person? Like, is it I, all day that you're at the keyboard? Yeah. How does that work? So um, it's it's not interesting because it's very boring it's all the time <laughs> it's the same you know i wake up barely i can barely wake up at maybe 10 in the morning mm-hmm. 11 sometimes noon because i usually work till five in the morning so ah. i'm not a morning person so yeah. mornings are it's hard it's hard for me so i you know i take a shower you know try to like you know with cold water trying mm-hmm. to to wake myself up and then i eat a uh, very conservative breakfast i'm a vegetarian so i eat buckwheat and, and avocado mm-hmm. uh always always the same every day (laughs) sometimes i like eating other things but this is just you know this works for me and for Mm -hmm. my body because if i eat something yeah if i eat like cereal then i feel Mm -hmm. awful and i'm bloated you know and Mm -hmm. i hate it uh so i found this recipe for me buckwheat and an avocado and a lot of works for you (laughs) Mm -hmm. right 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 and very strong black tea with lemon so this is my mm-hmm. morning you know thing that I do and then I go to my studio I have um, uh, I have a studio downstairs in my mm-hmm. apartment which is great I don't have to dress you know I usually dress in my pajamas but right. you know <laughs> so I eat and then I go and that's it and then I take maybe one break uh, to eat at night uh, you know mm-hmm. closer to mm-hmm. 6 p.m uh, after that I usually go on a bike ride for one hour and then I come back and I work till three or four in the morning so every day is like that wow so it's basically <laughs> all day i mean you're you're literally devoting your entire day to, to working except for yeah. eating and bike riding yeah that's yeah. that's pretty remarkable and i'm very grateful um, because i i love i love it you know i can achieve a lot uh because again i can write one day yeah. i can write a lot and then another day i will only write one measure but that measure will be worth it you know hmm. so it's a right, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah yeah, it, that's really interesting. So say you're writing, I mean, do you approach different types of music differently in the sense that if you're composing an opera, or if you're working a ballet or a chamber piece, is the process different or is it a similar process? Uh, I think in the in a essence of it, it's pretty similar, I would say, but there's specifics mm-hmm. to every genre. You know, when I'm writing for opera singers, I have to watch the range you know i can't go and <laughs> write mm-hmm. crazy passages because it will just not work so i'm a little bit more contained and when i'm writing for dance i have to uh, imagine you know the tempos uh, how fast it can be you know mm-hmm. um so but That's i think in, in a, in a core, you... uh, yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the process is the same so when you you wrote a ballet right Nos- is it uh N- nostalgia it nostalgia nostalgia mm-hmm. yeah so no, did you, project. how do you it's work with, did you Russian work with dance? Right, in the Russian way. So did you work with dancers? Mm-hmm. Because I imagine writing for, for you know, writing ballet is, is very particular to the, the movements of humans mm-hmm. and, you know, needing to be aware of that. So what was that like? Uh, you know, that project is probably one of my most important ones uh, to this day. Um, I really wanted to write a ballet for so many years. And then this opportunity came. Um, mm-hmm. It was through Aaron J. Kurnis, who recommended me to his friend oh, and collaborator. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, his name is Pascal Riu. He's a French choreographer based in New York. Mm-hmm. Fantastic, you know, like major figure in modern dance. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. He was looking for a young Russian composer. 
and RNJ Kurinas recommend uh, my candidacy. So Pascal uh, listened to every piece that I wrote and he wrote me this letter, send me more music. <laughs> So, you know, and I have a lot of things uploaded on the internet. He said, mm -hmm. send me everything that you have that's not, that's not on the internet. So he was really listening carefully if I am a good fit. But then he decided that I was a good fit for this program. He envisioned this program, you know, Tchaikovsky, uh, 19th century, then Stravinsky, 20th mm -hmm. century, and then a modern composer from Russia um, ah, in the 21st okay. century. So he wanted to showcase the, the history of, of Russian ballet music. And he commissioned me this piece. Uh, and I was very lucky because he didn't say, all oh, right, this and that. He said, channel in into your childhood and describe what it mm. was like, you know, to be you, to grow up in Russia in a small town and then to move to Moscow, then to move to the States. He was interested in mm. my uh, upbringing. Um, and I did, I did just that, you know, I basically I channeled and then, you know, this melody was born and we met in New York. I played this melody for him and he cried. He cried. He said, this is it. Oh, wow. This is good. Mm -hmm. This is good. Let's go on. And, and then every two weeks, every three weeks, we would meet in New York, just me and him in the, in the studio. And I would play mm -hmm. for him just how it's going, you know, and he was just listening and just listening and listening uh, and imagining, you know, recording on his uh, phone. And that basically the music came first pretty much. But then mm -hmm. when, when he started actually um, creating movement, actual movement and the way he works is very interesting he molds his dancers as if they were clay you know so he comes into the studio mm. and he suggests uh he suggests an idea like a fallen branch or okay. uh i don't know mm -hmm. a, a, a broken chain you know uh, things like that that are not related mm -hmm. to movement per se but he he suggests an, mm. uh, a visual image or an idea or an emotion and the dancers start moving and he picks ah. like this. This is good. This is so the way he works is so inspiring. You know, I was so happy watching him work, and with my music, that was just I was so happy during that time. I really want this to come back into my life again. Yeah. You know, um, and you know there there were times where he would be working in a phrase, and the music would go, and he said, "I wish this was longer, or uh -huh. this was shorter." You know, mm -hmm. and I had to compose right there in front of the dancers. I had my computer with me, you know, oh, and, and wow. finale, midi, midi, oh, she, very bad recording was playing. Mm -hmm. Poor dancers, you know, how they could handle this, I don't know. But they, they were interesting in the structure, you know, he was interested in, can you enlarge, enlarge this mm -hmm. phrase? And thankfully that phrase was just running 16 notes. So it wasn't very mm -hmm. hard to compose more of the 16 notes, you know, in, within a certain frame. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't like a new whole section. It was just right, elongating right. certain things or shortening some things. Uh, also changing the tempos, you know, that which mm -hmm. is relatively easy. Uh, but in terms of musical material, he didn't ask much. You know, he, mm -hmm. he was really he trusted me, trust my um, my gut a lot. Right. But he was always present. You know, every two weeks he would listen to where the music was going. Right. And, um, he helped me with the transition. Uh, the piece is structured in three sections and the transition from the first part to the second one, we were practically composing it together, you know, in the studio. Wow. It's like, oh, can, can this be longer? And that, he really influenced me on that transition, but it's, you know, in the scope of the piece, it's a very small, short, like one minute transition, mm -hmm. but he was very interested in, in how it goes. Uh, the idea was to go from present, mm -hmm. uh, from the past, to future and then mm -hmm. to the present. Mm -hmm. So from go to past into the future, he wanted this transition to be a very certain way. Um, but you know, just thinking about it makes me happy. You know, I was so blessed with that. Yeah. And that was my first dance piece. And then the dance pieces start happening in my life one after another. Now I'm on my number five wow. <laughs> in the last three years. That's it's pretty extraordinary. Like magical, magical portal just opened for me, you know, and I feel like my music just fits that so well because mm, my music so tends to have different sections in it you know it can uh -huh. go from one place to another very quickly and for dance is great yeah when there's a contrast yeah. like this mm -hmm. so yeah so that's so interesting that you were actually part of the collaborative process while he was choreographing the piece and asking mm -hmm. you to change elements of music mm -hmm. which I mean if you think about it I think you know 50 years ago would be really challenging to on the spot you know, change up. Now we have this technology where you, you said you were there with your computer and, yes. you know, you can just change whatever and the MIDI file comes out. And I mean, mm -hmm. do you think that technology has affected the way that music is written now and how composers approach it? I think 
definitely because we can hear immediately what are we writing even you know media representation is not the mm -hmm. most accurate but it really helps uh, I think it speeds up the process quite a bit mm -hmm. and sometimes I wish myself and my colleagues would take more time to write mm -hmm. you know because mm -hmm. sometimes it's just fast 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 like fast fashion you know fast everything mm -hmm. fast food so um, I feel like pieces from the past were more carefully written you know even in terms of the uh, music itself I'm not saying about how it was written in terms of you know physicality right, right. of it like there are mistakes and it's okay you know but the I feel like composers took more time on every piece mm -hmm. that's for sure <laughs> yeah yeah do you, I mean do you think that I, I used to conduct a lot of new works when I was teaching at Curtis I would conduct mm -hmm. all the young composers works and I could always tell the composers who were very much relying on what they were hearing back from the computer mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. you know what actual orchestration is because you know no matter how good playback is it's not actual instruments. So have exactly. you encountered Especially that in terms in, of balance, your teaching you know? experience? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, all the time, I keep making this mistake. You know, I trust the media too much sometimes because I have to produce a piece rather quickly. And I'm, a, I'm myself mm -hmm. a violinist and I played in orchestra, so I know exactly how it sounds. You know, I played for 13 years in the youth orchestra of Russia. So for me, it's only natural to write for orchestra. You know, and then I'm working mm -hmm. the piece and I'm listening to the playback. And for instance, I'm assigning a certain melodic, melodic material that's very important to the woodwind. And at the same time, the strings are playing something heavy and the brass, you know, uh, in a middle texture. Uh, and then in real time, in real situation, I cannot hear woodwind at all. Right, right. It mm -hmm. just, it just buried. It's, it's impossible physically. Mm -hmm. um, so and I made this mistake so many times and yet, mm -hmm. you know, it, it will keep happening to me because right. I love the certain sound of woodwind, um, you know, piercing clarinet sounds. And right, right. I, I, uh, a piece that actually inspired me to be so in love with this particular sound is my teacher's piece, um, Christopher Theophanidis' uh, Symphony Number no. 1. Mm. Uh, the way he starts it with E flat clarinets, three or four E flat clarinets just playing up high. Oof. That really influenced me so yeah. great. And then I try to play something like this in every piece that I write for orchestra because I just love the effect so much. But, um, you know, woodwinds are easily covered it by other like instruments. So, I mean, yeah, definitely. Do, do you think that, you know, all of these issues also arise from the fact that the modern symphony orchestra has these instruments and, you know, large string sections and brass that can play so loud? And, you know, it's a very different approach to sound. Do you think that influences in orchestrational choices and for sure for sure uh yeah the string sections are just so much bigger now than uh, used to be 100 mm -hmm. years ago or you know before that right. uh definitely uh and you know there are works for multiple wood with instruments like quadruple woodwinds mm -hmm. you know that's great when you have quadruple, but it's a right, rare opportunity. Right. It's, it's rarely uh, possible, actually. Yeah, yeah. So composers have to be very careful with scoring, you know, how yeah. it's balanced. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, trusting MIDI is not the best. Um, you have to kind of envision how it's going to sound in real life. It's mm -hmm. not easy. It's not easy. Yeah. It takes yeah. years of uh, real life experience. And then still, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So as, as a composer, I mean, I think the opportunities to write solo repertoire or chamber repertoire are probably higher than writing for full orchestra. Is that, would you say that's true? Right now, definitely. <laughs> right you now is the golden time. Yes. <laughs> In a way, yeah. you know, there's a part of me that kind of, uh, I'm, I'm ecstatic to see what my co colleagues will come up with for solo instruments. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, it depends on how the, one's career is, is kind of unfolding. For me, it was uh, a lot of orchestral writing, actually, just mm. and then a lot of dance writing for larger ensembles. But then right now, I i am excited to write for solo violin, you know, and right. to give the score right away to a fantastic violinist who, is, you know, have a bunch because I, I went to a wonderful school, of, you know, at Moscow Concerti. Mm -hmm. All of those violinists are phenomenal. <laughs> so... I just keep sending PDFs and they send me recordings right away because they're bored at home right. and they're practicing. And then I hear it and it's wonderful. So I have five caprices right now and I have multiple versions of it already. Oh, and it's just, uh, you know, it really helps me to to survive this because mm -hmm. all of the, of the all of the concerts were canceled, you know, major of ones. With Minnesota, yeah. Minnesota Orchestra canceled. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was so looking forward, you know, because I love Minnesota Orchestra. 
um, one of my favorite orchestras in the world. So I was looking forward to to work with them again. And then it, it canceled, and then they mm -hmm. rescheduled, and then they canceled again. Yeah. And uh, ma many more concerts got canceled, postponed. So it's not easy, you know, when you're working and you're dedicating your whole life, mm -hmm. and then everything just like you know better than anyone it just disappears and it feels like um what to do next how to survive so those violin caprices really helped me because mm -hmm. i was writing and i was hearing them right away mm -hmm. performed mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. my friends would record it and post it on facebook it's you know nothing much but still I got no, a it, it's still your creative process coming to life which is what you yeah. do right you, you sort mm -hmm. of give birth to this music and give it away and then someone else yeah it, like listens creates. to it yeah, yeah yeah so i think you still have that process going which i think is probably it's a sanity saver right it keeps you <laughs> it keeps you sane in a way i would imagine yes i'm very grateful you know i need to come back to it but now i'm busy i'm working on my fifth ballet as, as i mentioned for john abakair who is a phenomenal uh choreographer and mm -hmm. uh, artist and um it's scheduled to go on, you know, and I just finished uh, a large portion yesterday uh, at night, you know, and I sent it to the players and uh, the premiere is scheduled in late uh, August. And I'm like, fingers crossed. Late August I mean, as in a month from now? Yes. Wow. I'm, okay. I can't believe, but, you know, he's going on with it. So I'm not sure how it's going to happen. Maybe with now, with no, like zero audience in a hole. Mm-hmm or maybe some glass walls he's very right creative, so I, I cannot wait to see what he, what's he gonna create you know from this yeah i am very curious to see how that's gonna happen mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean everything's shut down in the states it feels you know so yes. it's, it's it's a huge challenge i mean what were you working on anything in march for you know the the last four months that we, did you have anything that was happening in march april may june that had to be canceled. Yeah, mm -hmm. my fourth ballet got canceled. Oh, well, really? not canceled, but the rescheduled for rescheduled for yeah. God knows when. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in New York uh, at Hunter College, and I was looking forward to it. Um, that ballet is written for solo piano and eight dancers, and uh, the idea is to have the piano on stage and the pianist uh, being a part of the choreography. Mm -hmm. So I was looking forward to it. I'm writing, I, I wrote this piece for my best friend, Konstantin Sokovetsky, who's a phenomenal pianist. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we already actually rehearsed, so it was ready to go. And ah. then everything got, got rescheduled. Right. So that was a major thing, you know, and a few, you know, orchestral performances. Yeah, a lot, yeah. actually. <laughs> I can't imagine, you know, for you, it's probably ton hundreds and hundreds of concerts, right? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it was six. I, I usually do two or three weeks of concerts every month. So, I mean, it's mm -hmm. just been month after month of, you know, every week I get more cancellations. It's really, it's I devastating know. for all of us, you know, but we try to find ways to keep creative and we talk to our mm -hmm. colleagues and we have mm -hmm. conversations and sort of, you know, keep our spirits up. And, yeah. and you have students I... too, right? Are mm -hmm. you teaching by remote? What's, what's happening? Yeah. So uh, up until late June or mid June, I was teaching remotely, you know, everything went online uh, in mid or early March. So mm -hmm. I'm teaching at the high school here in New Haven. It's called Educational Center for the Arts. It's a high school for creative arts, you know, it's mm -hmm. a magnet school, fantastic school. I love it so much. Mm -hmm. You have uh, five departments. Uh, I'm teaching the music department. Uh, so we went online, you know, I teach uh, for three hours every day, uh, mm -hmm. Monday through Thursday. I teach musicianship, composition, and strings. Okay. Uh, so everything went online, you know, for three hours a day, I would teach online. At first, it was actually very stressful because technology was just not working. With yeah. Me. <laughs> everything was frozen and the sound was bad and my students were stressed out. But then we learned. Yeah. Them and me, <laughs> we learned. Mm -hmm. And then on Fridays, I, I teach at Brooklyn College and uh, I teach composition, have eight students in my studio uh, and also we went online you know some of my students called me on FaceTime every Friday some called me on Skype mm -hmm. some on Zoom uh, and that was okay right. because those students are uh, older a little bit you know late teenagers you know in their 20s mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so but it was more you know I was like a psychotherapist for them because they, right. had, they had hard time motivating themselves to create so but thankfully we had some concerts scheduled so we had to finish the pieces you know and they produced some great work you know some of the pieces were remotely um recorded like one of my students wrote mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. a string quartet that was recorded you know two players were in mm -hmm. frankfurt germany uh, my friends 
violin and mm -hmm. viola. Uh, they're a couple, assembly couple. And then I played second violin and the cellist was in New York. So, and it was a very interesting experience, you know, for me as a player and for my students to organize everything and to be writing, knowing that it's going to be probably recorded mm -hmm. like that, you know. Yeah, so yeah. Close his, but just staying motivated was the hardest part for my students. Yeah. Uh, one yeah. of my students had to leave the country. He went to Korea. And oh. uh, he was so depressed, you know, he was also quarantined there, you know, it's, um, mm -hmm. you have to be quarantined in Korea, good yeah, for them, yeah. of course, but for a young composer, you know, being away from his family, he just came from the States where the situation was just so bad at the time in New York, oh, oh, oh. Right, right. and then he, he was depressed, he couldn't write for maybe more than a month, he couldn't write a note, yeah. and uh, we would just talk, you know, and I would mm -hmm. ask him, and uh, we would listen to music together and discuss it, so... It wasn't mm -hmm. so much composing, but, you know, just reflecting. Mm -hmm. He's now doing um, a remote Curtis program. I'm very happy for him. So oh, he's composing. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So, very That's challenging good. times. It is. It is. I mean, and then I'm, I'm glad you're supporting your students in, you know, these sort of more spiritual ways, because that is, you know, what makes an artist an artist, right, is to be able to sort of access those deep wellsprings of whatever it is and to, yeah. you know, bring it's it not easy, you know. For no, some people, it was really the first time they had to confront their own feelings in, in mm -hmm. such a way, you know. Right, right. Uh, so it takes guts, you know. Yeah, you have to have yeah. guts and bravery to be able to express what's really going on in mm -hmm. your head, you know. Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. also to be brave enough to not write at all if you don't feel like it. Right, um, right. There was a big piece by um, one of my fellow composers who wrote a big article on that, you know, I don't feel like composing and it's okay. Right. So, which is important. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of, you know, composers, performers right now, we have, we feel this obligation to keep creating um, in ways that we're not accustomed to. And mm -hmm. sometimes you just want to take a break and say, look, mm -hmm. I've had enough. I need a week off. I need a month off. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't always be producing because we're just mm -hmm. as stressed as, you know, everyone else is. And yeah. yet we're trying to stay creative as well. So mm -hmm. it's a huge challenge. Absolutely. Yeah. But, so, you know, yeah, I love the way you coping, you know, with your writing. I, I'm, I'm always reading your diaries. Thank you for, for writing this because it takes a lot of gut as well to, you know, to express your feelings. So I love your writing. And no, I, love I really the moment appreciate in passion. that. I love you, the moment in passion on, um, on YouTube. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, no, that it was, was really too. great. Just, yeah, no, I'm focusing on, but there's so many things that to try, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. I keep telling people I'm throwing things against a wall to see what sticks. But you know, mm -hmm. we have to explore all those sides of us. And mm -hmm. this is a I good love opportunity because, you know, to explore I, every I single passion. side you can think of. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, yeah. Those um, so looking towards the future what are the things that you're looking forward to what are, what are some things that you haven't done that you're hoping to do sometime maybe not so soon but sometime <laughs> you know for all of us girls you know it's a big question you know starting a family at some point uh, in yeah. one way or another you know that's a big that's a big one of course but yeah and it's uh, it's a life choice and you know there are obstacles and yeah. it's not always easy for many 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 reasons uh, but purely musical mm -hmm. you know which is um i think it's more pressing for me now uh i want to just go with my gut you know more and trust and sometimes my music becomes this primitive like primitive you know just a, a, a triad going up and down gut up and down and i feel like it you know and, and i will go with it Mm -hmm. because before I would be like what's going on this is just so strange and in fact when I would share something like this you know with my close friends and they say this is genius like this is something mm -hmm. so new so I want to go with that new wave that's coming you know it's more um, related to pop music I don't know I, I don't know how to express it and hmm. I want to do crazy ensembles you know like a rock group that's playing my music Mm -hmm. with a singer who is not classically trained so uh, mm -hmm. something like that something uh, completely outside but still being myself you know but mm -hmm. trying some different interesting combinations of sounds mm -hmm. so for sure that and yeah. you know more dance I, I love writing that mm -hmm. so I pretty much want to just keep doing what I'm doing you know but also expanding in different directions a little bit stylistically mm -hmm. uh, in terms of sound 
and exploring and you know you keep growing that way and I think that is that's the, one of the joys of being an artist right is to have these discoveries and to be able to change and develop your voice and you know maybe change your ideas about things that you had in the past and I you know I think that's one of the joys of being an artist and also to listening to a composer's music change over time mm -hmm. stylistically and you know taking chances that you never have before maybe yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah Oh, Paulina, thanks so much for joining me. I, you know, we've never My really pleasure. had a chance to chat so much. So, like, I feel yeah. like I've gotten to know you much better. And I've, you know, I've, I've performed your music and I adore performing your music because I just, Thank you. I find it so beautifully written. And as you said, melodious and it has, you know, these, it's, it's very soulful in Russian. So it, it really speaks to me. Thank you. I really hope we can collaborate on something really exciting, you know. I very, hope very so soon. Too. I hope so too. Yeah, I think we need to cook up something for when all of this is passed and, yeah. you know, life comes back to, live yeah. music comes back to us, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks so uh, much for joining thank you me. So much for yeah, me. take care. And this will be yeah. up for those of you who are viewing, this will be up on IGTV and it'll also be up on YouTube next week. Great. Thanks, Paulina. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.